On this episode, ARM announces a new processor, we talk lithium iron batteries, and I take a minute to talk about buzzers. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 15 of Daily IoT. We're back with some news today. I apologize, I don't have a scooter update today. Uh, I was feeling super sick when I woke up this morning, uh, did not make it into the office, uh, and so we didn't have a chance to shoot an update on that. But uh, stay tuned, this week there will be more updates on that. Uh, I've been getting great comments from people that are interested in the project, so uh, we will keep getting that to you, but I, I don't have a scooter update today. Hopefully you'll, you'll keep watching the episode anyway. Because we have news. Uh, first time in a little while here. Not a lot of news, just one item that I wanted to cover really quick, and that is coming out of ARM. So if you remember a little while ago, we talked about ARM being bought out by SoftBank, and this is, I believe, the first major announcement since that uh, acquisition. This doesn't have anything to do with the acquisition. I believe this was in the works well before that. But ARM has announced a new processor called the ARM Cortex-R52. And what they're targeting with this is, you know, honestly, I read a lot of the, the press releases. I gotta say, it's, it's a lot of corporate speak, from, but from what I gathered, they're trying to target things like autonomous vehicles, medical equipment, and uh, autonomous robots, maybe like factory robots. And the big thing that this um, chip design is going to provide is safety and security in critical timing applications. So one of the examples that they use when they talk about this is in a self-driving car, if something goes wrong in a user program, the thing can't just crash and go blue screen and kill everybody, right? Uh, you need to have some sort of exit mechanism that, be, that gets you into deterministic code execution and you can you know, slow the car down, pull it off to the side of the road and stop. And so uh, one of the things they're talking about is being able to run both application code and sort of this core security code in two separate sandboxes on the processor. And so uh, a term I want to cover really quick, if you haven't heard before, is this idea of deterministic execution of code. And so when you have a platform like, you know, your Onion Omega or your Raspberry Pi, these things that run Linux, uh, Raspberry Pi running Windows IoT core, those are what are called non-deterministic in uh, code execution, meaning an operating system is running and it's deciding when certain things are going to happen. It's got a scheduler that's deciding this thread gets so many cycles of the CPU, this thread gets so many cycles of the CPU. And so when you have things like interrupts, like I push a button or some external interrupt triggers a problem, it's a non-deterministic amount of time from when that input happens and when your user interrupt code executes. Whereas on things like a, a PIC microcontroller or even like an Arduino, when that input happens and that interrupt happens, based on the data sheet and the, the frequency that it's running at, you know exactly how long it's going to take from that event to happen to your code to run. That's called deterministic execution of your interrupt handler. And so what ARM is promising with this is that you can have deterministic execution in your high um, security and safety code, but also have uh, things running in like a user mode or application mode that uh, don't quite require that. And so uh, that's the latest coming out of ARM, interesting new chip. They said that uh, chip designs incorporating this uh, architecture should start appearing in, I think, I wanna say 2018, uh, so we're a little ways out, but uh, news coming out of ARM today. Okay, the next thing I wanna cover is some research that I've been doing about battery um, chemistries. And so everybody knows about the scooter project. We're doing that. We have the scooter at work. Uh, however, I've also acquired a scooter at home. I've got a real problem. I've got scooters everywhere. I got one in my garage and one at work. I'm working on them at both places. Um, but I want to talk about the battery selection for these. So the one at work that we have has two sealed lead acid batteries, otherwise known as SLAs. That's a common term that you'll hear. And it, it's, it works great. They're, they're two 12 volt batteries that are rated at 10 amp hours. They're hooked up in series to provide a 24 volt system voltage. Now, the scooter that I have here at home also had two 12 volt batteries in it. Um, however, they were rated at 30 amp hours. Now, if you remember from a previous episode, when we talk about amp hours, that's really just the capacity of a battery. And so uh, the batteries that are in my scooter are 
are big enough to last three times as long as the batteries at the work scooter. Now, mine are completely dead, however. They don't work anymore, so I need new batteries. Now, I could just buy two new SLAs, but I wanted to research uh, a lithium option. And so I'm not a battery expert. Um, I just know that lithium batteries are all the rage nowadays. So I did about two to three hours of research and came upon a new lithium battery technology. Now, this isn't brand new. It's been around for quite a while. Um, I think it was like the University of Texas or something discovered this back in the 90s. Uh, but commercialization takes time after academic uh, findings. And so a, a newer battery that's becoming more popular is called a lithium iron phosphate battery. Now, most uh, of your consumer electronics, your, you know, your, your iPhones and your iPads and your laptops and things are going to have a lithium um, chemistry, which is known as lithium cobalt oxide. And that's what the cathode is made of. All batteries have a cathode and an anode. I'm not going to get into the chemistry of batteries, but what we're talking about is what the cathode is made of. And so common consumer electronics, it's lithium cobalt oxide. It's a mouthful. Um, this new one that I came across is lithium iron phosphate. And now uh, after a bunch of research, these things are amazing. I'm not sure why I hadn't heard of them until just this last week. Um, so a common problem with your standard lithium batteries is thermal overrun. If you've been watching the news, Galaxy Note 7's catching fire, that is the result of thermal overrun, which means that during overcharging and at room temperature, just normal operation, they can overheat and in some cases explosively overheat. It turns out lithium iron phosphate batteries do not have that same problem. They're very stable and don't suffer from thermal overrun. And so as I went through and did this research, there's all kinds of benefits to lithium iron phosphate batteries. They don't have that problem, kind of big. Uh, supposedly they're non-toxic uh, from all I can tell. So um, that actually transfers into another benefit, which is they are cheaper to manufacture, which that cost savings is passed on to me, the consumer, and results in a cheaper battery. And so they're cheaper, they're non-toxic, they're safer. Um, another great advantage they have over SLAs is uh, a lead acid battery that's maybe 12 volts. Um, when it's fully charged, it'll be up around 12.6, 12.8 volts. And then as you use it and it starts to die, that voltage starts to drop 12.5, 12.4. And eventually it'll dip below the system voltage that you need. It'll get down to 11 something. However, it won't have used all of its capacity. You're stuck with a lot of capacity in the battery that you can't use because the voltage level isn't there. That's just due to the chemistry of the battery. Lithium iron phosphates, however, don't suffer from that. They will give you that system voltage almost all the way till the end before they die. So that's another uh, huge advantage. So far, the only drawback that I've been able to find on the lithium iron batteries is the energy density, meaning for its size and weight, it can't hold as much capacity as one of your uh, other lithium ion batteries. And so uh, just something that I'm, I'm researching, uh, I think I'm gonna pick up uh, two or one lithium iron phosphate batteries for my scooter and I'll report back on how that works out. Um, give you the, the lowdown on that as it compares to the lead acids that we have on the scooter at work. Okay, again, I'm packing a lot into this episode. I apologize if it's running a little long, but I just wanted to cover this really quick, uh, which is another Internet of Things project item. You saw it in the intro. Um, I've got this particle photon running a simple program that's got a light sensor that if I turn on, geez, um, while it's booting up, that when the light sensor gets a certain light, uh, it rings a buzzer. And the buzzer is really what I want to talk about. You can hear that. Take the light off. goes off. Okay. What this is, and pulled off here, is what's called a piezo buzzer. And uh, I want to bring in things like this from time to time to talk about uh, things that you can have in your project as they relate to real world Internet of Things devices. And so you think of things like fridges or maybe even alarm clocks that have tone uh, alarms or like the fridge where my kids leave it open, it starts to beep at you. Um, that can be accomplished with a little piezo buzzer. And all you do is you hook it up to your um, Internet of Things platform and you send a square wave to it and it will make different tones. That square wave frequency will determine the frequency of the tone. So it's a cool little thing that you can add to your project. Uh, if you have a, in this case, I'm using a particle photon or an Arduino, there's a very simple 
um, language feature built in called tone. You can call tone the pin number that this is hooked to and a frequency, and it will generate that square wave for you. Easy peasy. Um, you can do that on Arduino and Photon. On other platforms, you have to, um, they may have features built in, but you have to generate that square wave. So uh, just a, something to consider if you need any sort of uh, tone or beeping uh, on your Internet of Things project, a piezo buzzer. You can pick these up for like a buck fifty at SparkFun or Adafruit um, or other distributors like that. So just wanted to mention that really quick. Okay, last thing for today's episode is... I, uh, I got an interesting email the other day from a company called, I don't really know how to pronounce it, ITEAD.cc, I-T-E-A-D.cc, saying they had found me online and wanted to know if I'd be interested in a free sample uh, if I would write a review or do a review on their product. And so um, I've talked to different people. Some people think that's selling out, like, oh, you people are sending you stuff, you're selling out to the man. Um, I personally don't feel that way, uh, but wanted to get your take on it. I had an idea for this, um, which is what they want to give me is a touch display, a uh, full touch display um, from their lineup, their, uh, I can't remember what it's called, Nexteon display, I think. I'll link it up down below. You can check it out. Uh, but anyway, the thought I had was to have them send me one of these. I will do a review on an episode of Daily IoT, talk about it and then turn around and give it away to one of you. I don't really have a need for the screen, uh, but I thought that'd be a cool thing. Get one, do a review, give it to one of the watchers. I keep saying watchers, viewers of the show. Um, so let me know what you think uh, down in the comments. Uh, see if that's a, you know, if you think that's a good idea or if you're like, no, I don't take things from the man because you're selling out. One thing I will add, however, is that if I do a review and I would check this uh, first with them is it's going to be a truthful review. I want to be completely transparent with you guys. I would never take a sample and turn around and give a good review just because that was the expectation. If I get a screen from these people and it sucks, I will tell you it sucks. And so um, just a thought I would love if you could, uh, the comment question of the day is, should I get a display from uh, this company? Uh, from what I can tell, just to give a little bit of background, it looks like it's a company based out of China uh, that's a lot like a SparkFun or an Adafruit or a Seed Studio like that. Um, that just has a lot of different uh, things for Internet of Things projects, electronics projects. So uh, that's the question of the day. I will wrap this episode up. It is going super long, longer than I had hoped for. But if you've made it this far, I really appreciate it. I appreciate you watching. And uh, again, if you have any feedback or questions, hit me up in the comments down below. I would love to hear from you. Otherwise, uh, that's it for today's episode of Daily IoT, the show where together we're learning all about the Internet of Things one day at a time.